I think that may be the best swap frame going right now. Welcome back folks to Random Ride Shop. I had to start mowing yesterday. I've been telling you I need to get that 57 pickup on a frame so I can move it around. Well, I had to mow around yesterday, so we're gonna do our best to get that 57 on a frame so I can roll it around. The frame I've decided to put underneath that 57 is a 1996-98 Explorer. Uh, it's the sport model, so it's about 12 inches too short. And I've been, I've been going along the path of extending that frame, but I came up with a different idea. <laughs> We'll see if you like it.
Okay, <laughs> we're back. You know, I kind of started this video off and just went, went to town. So here is the roll up. <laughs> In the first video, you know, I went over five different frames that people use for frame swaps. Some more than others, but we had the S10, we had the Explorer, uh, the Trailblazer, the Tahoe, and the Crown Vic. Each one of them have good points and bad points. Uh, for the 57 truck I got, I want to use this Explorer chassis. In my mind, this is like really, really close to the perfect top guard chassis. Four wheel disc brakes, independent front suspension, rack and pinion steering, has an 8.8, and it's not hard to find Posi tracks. This one actually has, this is a 373 Posi track, 8.8 uh, .8 rear end. Oh, it's kind of got all the good stuff. The difficulty with the Explorer chassis is they're never the right length. So the four-door is like 111 inches wheelbase. The Sport, which is what I've got, is 101.7 uh, wheelbase. All the old trucks is right at 114 inches. So you need to make <laughs> you need to make them longer. Now. When I first, you know, when I first thought about this, I was just gonna cut the frame rails and make the chassis longer. That, that's pretty common. I mean, that's kind of the way, it, you know, in the hot rod world, that's what we do, right? We cut it, make it longer, shorter. As I was looking at this, it occurred to me, and let me get the camera down here. So, as I was looking at this, the kick up in the back is flat, right? And a lot of them, it, it, there's a hump back here, but in the Explorer is flat. That got me to thinking, and <laughs> that's always dangerous. <laughs> I actually like the trailing arm suspension on the old C10 pickups, you know, the 60s and 70s pickups. What would it be if we put the trailing arm suspension underneath the Explorer chassis. At that point, I don't actually have to cut this frame. I just move the wheels back. And at the end of the day, lengthening this frame back here, lengthening the back of the frame, now that really is pretty trivial. There's no, there's really no structure to worry about. Um, it is weld some, weld some tubing on there and you're, you're, you're golden. I've got a number of the, these old trucks from 63 to uh, 60, 71, I guess. So what I decided to do is I went, <laughs> I went and found some parts. What I did was I took the center brace, the trailing arms, and the rear end, you know, out of a 60s truck. You notice that when I mocked this up, I had the Chevy rear end with the trailing arms and the center section. I did that because that just reduces the variables, right? I know that was all, all of that assembly was in the right location. I just needed to get that assembly in this vehicle. And you can see now that I got the 8.8 in there. We'll finish talking about that in a minute. The biggest challenge was finding the center line of the front axle. I couldn't find a frame drawing of this thing, so I went back and forth and back and forth. And in the end, I just assumed that the center line is the center of the upper shock hole. It's pretty close. Now somebody, you know, somebody actually has a drawing. <laughs> Anybody actually has a drawing of the Ford Explorer chassis? I would be I would, I, I'd greatly appreciate, you know, telling me exactly what the factory says the center line is because I kept going back and forth. At this point, we're going to set this up, the center line of the shock tower, but, you know, it could be the front, <laughs> the front edge or the back edge of the, of the shock tower hole or the shock hole. It's not going to matter. Right, we well, there's enough movement in these in this this old truck. It's not going to matter, but just for my own curiosity, if anybody actually has a drawing, I would greatly appreciate it. Anyway, based on the center line of that shock hole, 
pull back 114 inches, <laughs> you can see I made three marks. <laughs> it turns out that this rivet here and the one on the other side don't seem to be in the same place. So you can see the line on this one. It's just to the aft of the center line of that rivet. On this one, the actual line, the actual line is this one right here. So, you know, about a half inch further. But if I pull a, if I pull a tape, we got, you know, 23 and 5 eighths inches. And we got about 23 and 5 eighths inches. You can also pull a measurement from this rivet. You can pull a measurement from this hole, which I don't even remember what that hole is on the Explorer, but that hole's the same on both sides. And that hole's the same on both sides. So pulling a measurement from all of those, I determined <laughs> that the <laughs> I determined that the placement of that cross member to the front edge of that hole is 82 and a half inches. 82 and a half on the driver's side. On the passenger side, We got 82 and a half inches. And that's plus or minus the 16th. <laughs> so let me show you the rivet I'm, I'm going to. So the rivet I'm measuring from is the one on this, right by this mount, on the back side of it, and pulling forward. So 82 and a half inches from here to there. Where I ended up putting the cross member, I'm measuring to the front edge of the hole in that cross member. It's 39 and 3 eighths. On this side, I've got 39 and 3 eighths. So, from our rivet, the back side, to where that new cross member needs to land, that's what I came up with. You know, measure your own and <laughs> convince yourself, but that's where I ended up with. And so with the cross member there, that puts the center line of your rear axle pretty close to 114 inches from the center line of the shock tower. The, from the center line of the shock tower hole. You know, in the end, that all sounds pretty simple, <laughs> but that was all, that took a long time. When I'm looking, I'm sitting here looking at it right now, I'm like, man, what did you do? Well, I learned how to read a tape measure. <laughs> so in the end, so you might be asking yourself, you know, that was a, uh, why did you just lengthen the frame? Well, let me show you. So the frame widens out, and then the question becomes, okay, where do you cut it? You know, you can cut it up here. The front, the front section is straight, but if you notice, when Ford makes these at the factory, they make them in three pieces. They make the front suspension, they make the rear, and then based on the, you know, based on how long they want the frame, they weld in this section here just to connect point A to point B. And so the front suspension is straight, the piece they weld in is going at an angle. So you can cut it right here, but if you think about that, when you cut this and move it back, now this is sitting right here. So you've got to spread the frame out, which May not be that big a deal. I mean, there's a couple of guys on YouTube that have done that and it works just fine. 
Same thing happens at the back. I looked at the back and it's interesting that the plates, the beams they weld in here, they actually straighten out because these back frame rails are parallel to each other. This piece they weld in is bent and goes straight back and I looked at, well, I just need to extend the straight piece. That way everything, you know, everything, everything stays happy. Well, the, the, the leaf springs are all connected underneath there, riveted and welded, and that turned out to be a problem. So, what you're in, what, what you're, uh, what you end up with is you need to extend, you need to, you need to make a trapezoid taller. And the only way that works is if you bend or stretch. Or if you, you know, open, open up the trapezoid to make it work. Perfectly reasonable way to do that. You weld it in, you, you know, you sleeve it, you weld it together, it's not going anywhere. The more I thought about that and trying to come up with the right sleeve, this is two and a half inches by five and a half, that's not standard, so you gotta come up with a way to make the sleeve. Again, it's, it's doable. Then it occurred to me, you know, I'm a Chevy guy. I got a lot of, I got a lot of old Chevys. I like this trailing arm suspension. It's reliable. It's pretty much bulletproof, and you can, you know, you can lower the truck, raise the truck. And it's pretty straightforward. So I'm like, okay, why don't I just use one of those? So that's what I proceeded to do. When I first mocked this up, I left the assembly together. So the cross member of the trailing arms and the Chevy rear end, I left it all together because, you know, that's how it was made. <laughs> I, I got a fairly high level of confidence that the thing's going to work. These things have got millions of miles on them. I've driven them a million. <laughs> probably all told a million miles. So I left, I left the Chevrolet assembly together. By this time, I had the 114 inches. I knew where it needed to go. And when I finally figured out where to put the cross member, you notice I, this, is a, this isn't welded in yet. I've got it, I've got it tacked in, so it'll be, it'll be positioned. One of the biggest issues with this is <laughs> they wanted, the cross member wanted to keep going back and forth and floppy and yeah, that was exciting. Once I got that welded in, then I took the Chevrolet rear end off and dropped the 8.8 on here. Now, I'm gonna get the camera down here and I'm gonna show you what's going on and what we gotta do. So right now, I've got the, I've just got those trailing arms kinda rednecked around, the, around that axle so I can move this thing around. So here's what we got going on. The 8.8, the spring pads, are perp they, they're perpendicular to the axle. On the, on the Chevys, you can see that the spring pad is at an angle. That's the angle the trailing arms are at. Those are aftermarket items. I welded those on my 71. My 71 has a square body rear end in it, and so I just ordered those online. I don't remember how much they are, but they're not very expensive. So I need to order a set of those pads and cut that forward pad off there and put that square put that uh put that trailing arm pad on there. At that point, this thing will be bolted up. When I did the 71, I didn't weld those on initially. I waited until the truck was pretty was was complete and had all of its weight on it so I could set the pinion angle. Then I tacked them on Pull the rear end out, welded them all up. I'll do the same thing to this. The other, the other nice thing about this, I stuck the springs in there. Now those aren't the springs I'm gonna use. I've got four inch drop coils in my 71 and I'll put, four, I'll put the four inch drop coils in this one. But the spring lines up on the frame. So basically make an upper spring pad, pretty much like it was in the C10 and you can use factory springs on this thing. That's a win. Or if, you know, if you want to use coilovers or whatever you want to do. Now, so also, I'm going to bust the rivets on this and slide this back so I can use the stock shocks. And that brace also 
has the sway bar connection in it. So we'll move that back, effectively 12 and three quarters, 12 and a quarter inches. And that should hook up the shocks, it should hook up the sway bar. We got our springs, the axle's located. I think that's a win. I'm gonna drag up the frame for the my 57. It's actually a 59, but they're the same frame except the 59, the, uh, the front of the frame's like three inches longer. But in terms of mounting the cab and everything else, the 59 is the same as the 57. Um, and if I remember right, that extra frame has to do with how they, they changed the, they changed how the radiator is port mounted. It may be 58 and 59, because it may have something to do with those dual headlights. I don't remember. Anyway, before we get started on that, and before I forget, I've taken a number of these trailing arms uh, trucks apart over the years. I don't think, at this point, they're getting old enough, I don't think I have... I don't think I've actually uh, come across a good, what I would consider a good set of trailing arms. Maybe if you're in Arizona or something that doesn't rust, but the way these things are made, they're just two pieces of C-channel, and it's just eighth inch, right, that is spot welded together, right, it's bent and it's spot welded together, but there is nothing sealing that gap. And so you crawl under, you crawl under a pickup that's been in any <laughs> you know, that's been used on a farm, mud, and everything else, chances are you're going to see those, those C channels trying to spread apart because they're rusting in the middle. On my 71, I found a, I basically took them apart. Let me, uh, I'll be right back. I'll bring you one. So here's what the trailing arm looks like. You can see there's a bend here, but relative to our conversation right now, factory stamps these two things and then they just spot weld them together. None of this is sealed so mud, dirt gets in there, it gets wet, it turns to mud and then it starts rusting the inside of these things and it starts moving them apart. On my 71 I cut and <laughs> cut these things apart until I found two that were uh, reasonably good and <laughs> welded them back together. I haven't found a good set yet. As much as I uh, don't like buying new parts, I gotta tell you, if you're rebuilding an old Chevy truck that's got the trailing arms, you need to kind of look at this. Uh, especially if you happen to want to put some power on it. Um, it's amazing. I've, I've got some of these that this this is actually rusted. <laughs> it's rusted in two, so there's holes in this thing. Anyway, that's just trivia for today. Um, if you're doing if you're doing old Chevys, take a look at the trailing arms. Um, the aftermarket makes these out of box tubing, and the truth is, the trailing arms under this uh, that I've got under here. Uh, they're not any better than these. <laughs> so I'm going to try my hand at making a set of trailing arms, and we'll see how that works out. Uh, stay tuned at a later date. <laughs> All right, enough of that. I'm going to get the tractor, and I'm going to drag, I'm going to drag that 59 up here, and we're going to take some measurements on this thing and see if we can figure out where these cab mounts need to be. Because I'm still going down the path. I, I really want this 57 on this frame so I can, you know, quit mowing around it. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to you. All right, where do you think the, uh, where do you think the center line of this thing is? Giving a little bit of weight on that front axle, and you know what? I think I'm gonna put the tractor down on that because I'm actually wondering if that hole right there is in the center line of that front axle. Doesn't look like it from there, but let me get some weight on that thing. I know it's in a the shadow there, but that looks pretty close. I think we're gonna measure from that hole. 
All right. <laughs> well, if it ain't right, we'll always thought it should have been. <laughs> let me let me back the tractor out of the way, and let me set up some sticks and see if we can do some measuring. Alright, so I found my drawing. My 42 and 9 sixteenths is supposed to be 42.7, plus or minus a little bit on the drawing. The distance between the back cab mounts is supposed to be 40 and right at an eighth, and I got 40 and 3 eighths. So, you know, that's plus or minus an eighth on both sides of the holes. So you might ask, why did you measure that if you had the drawing? Well, it's because not everybody has a drawing and not every time I've had the drawing. So you can measure this stuff and it will work. Those numbers that I got aren't far enough off given the slop that's in the mounts and everything else. Those would have worked and there's no, <laughs> there's no guarantee that my numbers aren't actually right relative to the way this, this truck was built. So, now we're going to see if we can transfer these numbers onto the Explorer and figure out what it's going to take to make some cab mounts. Now the trick is to measure those and see if we got the same distance from a reference point. So from my rivet back there that I showed you earlier, I got 71 and 5 eighths. Well that's pretty close, 71 and 5 eighths. Well that leads me to believe that uh, that may be right. I think that front mount is close enough for government work. Now we got to figure out the width. We need 50 inches. Well, according to this, 
the center point of my mount needs to be eight and five eighths out from this direction. Okay. Well, I got the I got the front mounts on. That's just two by four rectangular tubing. They're uh, they're tacked on pretty well, but I want to set the cab on. You know, like everything else, you just want to make sure that uh, all your measurements work. So I'm gonna pull this thing out. I'm gonna go get the I'm gonna go get the cab loaded up, and we're gonna to try to set that cab on now. I don't know if you remember from the uh, the project video, that cab's still got the front end on it, and that is a ton and a half wheat truck uh, cab. So the front fenders have got to come off. But either way, I'm gonna have to cut the front of those frame horns to get that to set down. So whether it's a half ton, three quarter ton, one ton, it doesn't matter. The radiator support's gonna set down further than those front frame, frame, frame horns. So I'm gonna go get the cab I'm with the front end on it. I'm gonna set that thing on here and then drag the sawzall out and probably, we'll see, but my plan at this point is go ahead and cut those frame horns off after I get this thing set on there. So, uh, I don't have the back mounts made kind of running out of time is what the problem is. Let me, uh, let me drag this thing out and let me go get the cab, get it hooked up to the tractor, and I'll bring you back when I'm uh, getting ready to set this thing on here. Well, folks, it's setting down on there. <laughs> I'm happy to see it on there. For those of you who watched the uh, first video, remember I said that uh, some trucks, you need to see how they sit in terms of where that front wheel is? Well, apparently this is one of those trucks. I didn't have this. I don't have one of these that's all together, so I didn't know how the factory one was going to set up in there. But it looks like that front wheel needs to go about two inches back. Maybe an inch and a half. have to look at it. Probably two inches. I'm going to get the half-ton fenders on there, and we'll see how that looks. But I'm thinking that cab mount needs to come forward. But, be that as it may... I think that turned out pretty good. No cutting, no welding to lengthen the frame. Put in the trailing arms and Bob's your uncle. In the end, there just there ain't a lot up here that has to be mushed too. You can see there's the there's the shock tower. And I've kind of whittled, whittled it out a little bit to clear that, but that's not actually a, uh, that's not as much as I thought it was going to have to be. And 
I ended up, I just whacked off 17 inches on those frame rails. We'll add, we'll add back in whatever we need to add back in. Right now I've got two befores spacing this thing up. That's, the mounts that go on this I believe are one inch. So that's, that's about a half inch higher than it's going to be. So one of the subscribers wanted to see how the international set was kind of setting outside on level ground. Now the only thing I've done to that frame is I've lowered the front torsion bars down quite a bit. They're still not bottomed, but they're down quite a bit. I'm actually liking the way that's going to set once I kind of run it around the front end settled. So what that's going to mean is I'm going to have to cut the bump stop off this thing so that I get a little more suspension travel in the front. But I am definitely happy with that. Let me go get back in the shade. Okay, so it's been a long weekend. Let me uh, let me wrap it up. Ford Explorer, you know, I went looking. Not many people use a Ford Explorer under a Chevy. I think that's a mistake. It's a nice package. Four-wheel disc brakes, rack and pinion, 8.8, which is a 12-bolt. Any way you shake it, it's a 12-bolt. It's got 30 splined axles. It's not hard to find one with limited slip. Go find you a 12-bolt with uh, limited slip. About the only factory thing you can get from General Motors nowadays is the uh, government locker, which I think we talked about that. That's primarily for low speed slip conditions, right? Bad weather. It's not a hot rod locker. It's the reason uh, they blow up. <laughs> anyway, for a DIY frame, putting the trailing arms on is kind of, uh, man, that's nice. It took me a while to figure out where the measurements were, but quite honestly, the second one's gonna be a whole lot easier. And we're definitely gonna do another one for the 49. So I think that may be the best swap frame going right now. You know, I know Chevy guys may, uh, may be shaking their head on that, but I'm telling you, that Explorer's more Chevy than it is Ford. <laughs> definitely now that I got Chevy trailing arm stuff in it, Okay, I think we're going to call out a video. Again, it's been a long weekend. I appreciate you watching. If you're already a subscriber, man, I do appreciate it. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Make a comment. And uh, until next week, Random Rod Shop out.